I should let you know that um, Gwyneth is not here because she is at the lady, uh, the annual ladies uh, conference that she goes to with her mother and uh, with her sister and uh, some of her friends uh, up in Muskoka. And so she is, uh, I, I'd say she's missing you, but she's not really because she's enjoying herself and having a wonderful time at that and is very glad that she's able to do that again. As for Aaron, who is not here this morning, he is not feeling well. Pardon me? He, Lydia says he sounds disgusting. So, more disgusting than usual, I guess. Yeah. So, um, anyways, he's, he's fine. He'll be fine, but he's not here. So, my family is absent. Kieran, of course, is off at university, so they couldn't be here for your, uh, your appreciation time, which I've... Recorded. It's recorded, so they can watch it later. I... I... Thank you. I... I... <laughs> Jared, Jared volunteered to give the sermon. No, no, he didn't. Um, I, I am just so, I'm so blessed by you. And you are so gracious to me and to my family. And I, I have rarely been so blessed um, in, in my life as I have been so far in this almost seven years with you. And I am so grateful for you. I feel like standing here and <laughs> this is an ish me as my kids would say. I, I feel like standing here and telling you about how um, I'm not worthy of your appreciation and how um, I'm not really that great a pastor and um, I'm sorry for all the mistakes I've made and the ways in which I've let you down. Um, and, and I, you know, if I have ever let you down, I am very truly sorry for that. But that being said, I am so grateful that God brought us together. And I know that Gwyneth and my kids, they feel the same way very much. And so, um, please, um, by all means, continue to appreciate me as I appreciate you. Uh, but also, please remember that if, if I ever do let you down, which I will, I'm human, um, or if, I, if you do ever have any uh, concerns or issues, I, I want to talk with you about them, and I, I want to hear about them, and I want to walk alongside with you um, in whatever journey that we have together. So um, thank you, and I love you, and I'm so grateful for you. Well... This morning, for our message, we are coming uh, at the book of Hebrews, and, and we're, we're looking at a passage, Hebrews chapter 5, verses 1 to 10, uh, and, and it, has, uh, it has a couple of little difficult phrases that we will unpack, but essentially, this is a, this is a basic gospel message. This is getting back to and reminding ourselves of the core of our good news that we have received from God. And so I'll invite you to turn to, uh, to Hebrews chapter 5 or to pay attention and follow along on the projector there as well um, and, and hear the words of God. Remembering that the author of Hebrews, and we're not entirely sure who uh, the writer of Hebrews was. We are entirely sure that it was inspired by God. We're just not entirely sure who the human author was. But whoever the human author was, 
they were speaking primarily to Jewish people and they were speaking to them about how Jesus is the fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies and that they, they ought to put their hope and trust in Jesus. And so this is the gospel message for the people of Israel. But more than that, it is the gospel message for us as well. We remember that we, even though many of us are of Gentile stock, we are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. And so in, 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 a, in a very real and significant way, we are part of the family of Israel. And so the message targeted at the people of Israel right at the beginning uh, turns and becomes one that is equally applicable to us as well. And so we read these words, every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Some though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, brothers and sisters, there's a couple things that we need to remind ourselves of. First of all, we need to remind ourselves a little bit about who Melchizedek was. Does anybody remember who Melchizedek was? Yes? Ah, you stuck up your hand. Yes! Eric, who is Melchizedek? I knew you were that kind of guy. That's awesome. That's good. That's perfect. Yeah, he was. And in fact, Abraham uh, presented homage to, uh, gave a tithe to Melchizedek. Um, and, and he's a bit of a mysterious figure because he wasn't, um, he wasn't part of Abraham's family, but yet we are told he was a priest of the Most High God as well as king. He was this mysterious figure. Some theologians have speculated that perhaps somehow Melchizedek was a, a pre-incarnation appearance of Jesus, the Son of God. That, that somehow before Jesus was born as a human being uh, coming from Mary um, and Joseph, um, well, Joseph's adopted father sort of thing, um, that, that Jesus came to earth on occasion. Uh, they speculate that, but we don't really know that. All that we know is that he was recognized as someone who was a, a high priest and a king and holy and righteous, and so he was given a tithe. But obviously, he was very well respected 
So much so that the people of Israel, even though they didn't necessarily know a lot of the details about Melchizedek, they revered that name and that order uh, for long afterwards. Another thing that we need to deal with is we need to deal with the question of whether or not Jesus was perfect. You'll find that in verse 8 and 9. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Now, this is tough because we, we think to ourselves, well, Jesus was perfect. And he was. This is not the same thing. This is not saying that Jesus was not perfect and then was made perfect in the sense of not having sinned. This is saying Jesus was um, incomplete in learning his obedience, and he was made perfectly complete in his obedience by going through all that he went through. Think about it this way. If you start a job, uh, that you're hoping will be your career. Um, I, I've heard that it takes approximately 10,000 hours to become really an expert at whatever it is that you have been called to do, whether it's farming or preaching or working in assembly line or, or being an engineer or whatever it is. It takes a long time. It's not that at the beginning you will have been sinning, and at the end you no longer sin, but rather at the beginning you don't know everything. You may have a lot of book learning perhaps, but you've still got a lot of experience that you need to get. And by the end, that experience will have made you extremely proficient and expert in what you are doing. And so you need to remember that for Jesus, Jesus who has lived eternally together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, three in one, Jesus emptied himself of everything and became, the Bible says, in very nature a servant, becoming one of us. This was in, in some eternal sense that we don't quite understand, Jesus becoming fully human. And one of the things that humans do is we learn and we grow. We are not perfect at doing everything right from babyhood. Right? There's two different senses of the word perfect here. When Jesus was born, and an infant in Mary's arms, could he walk? No, he couldn't. He wasn't perfect at walking, right? Could he see far distances? No, babies can't see far distances. He has to grow. Could he talk? No, he could not. In order to be truly human, he needed to live a truly human experience. Let me ask you a more challenging question. If Jesus had math class, I don't know if Jesus had math class, but if Jesus had math class, or when Jesus was learning carpentry from his father, do you think that he did everything that he was told perfectly the first time? I'll tell you what, he didn't sin, but making a mistake in your measurements is not the same as sinning, right? Because we'd be in big trouble if that were the case, right? Jesus was human and divine. Jesus learned and grew just like we did. 
Otherwise, how could he stand in for us? How could he say that he is acquainted with grief and familiar with all of our struggles? He, he says, the Bible says that, that he is familiar with all the temptations that are common to humanity. He knows what we face. Why? Because he faced the same thing. Now, of course, the big difference is that when he was faced with the temptation to sin, he did not fall to that temptation to sin, which is amazing and incredible and awesome. But he learned and he grew. This is what it means when it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He went through all kinds of stuff. And every time he suffered something new, he learned a new level of obedience. So that by the, by the time he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he is still pleading with God honestly and heartbreakingly that God the Father would take away this cup. But he has learned such complete obedience that he says, yet not my will, but thy will be done. Even when facing horrible torture and death at the hands of People who would be his enemies. This is what the author of Hebrews means when it says that Jesus was made perfect in his obedience. And being made perfect in his, his obedience, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Now we need to unpack that a little bit. Because here's the reality. We talk often about. Um, um, propitiation. And the atonement. And, and those are true things. So basically. Um, the atonement. Is that. Um, that idea that basically. Someone needs to. Take the punishment that we deserve because we are not capable of taking it ourselves and, and making our relationship with God good. It, it's the, the long term for it is substitutionary penal atonement. Okay? It basically means that it's like we all are in court. And we all have been, we have all been charged with high treason against the King of Kings, our God. And we have all been charged with his murder. And we have all been charged with countless, countless crimes against God. And we are not capable of taking that punishment, nor are we capable of making things right with God. And so someone who never did anything sinful needs to take our place or else we are hopelessly lost. And so the image has been told of the, the courtroom where like God the Father is the judge, but then the Son, Jesus, he stands up and says, you know what, judge, I will take Cole's punishment. I will take... Uh, Ava's punishment, and, and just to pick on Verberg's, uh, I will take Angela's punishment, uh, right? Um, and, and he does. And so then the judgment and the, the punishment passes off of you and onto Jesus, who takes it. But because he is sinless and perfect, even that punishment cannot keep him down. The death that we all earned, he triumphs over, right? That's substitutionary penal atonement, right? Which is true. That is one of the ways of looking at what Jesus did when he died on the cross and rose again for us. 
But there is also another way in which Jesus is our salvation. There's many different ways in which Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is also our salvation in the reality that we were designed, we were meant, we were built to live in perfect obedience to God. We were, we were designed to live in that perfect, loving, humble, submitted relationship of a, <clears throat> of a, of a child to a father, of a servant to a king. Uh, uh, that's what we were designed for. And yet, right from the very beginning, Adam and Eve broke that to pieces when they did not obey God but instead decided to try and take control of their own lives and chart their own destiny. And yet, that is not what we were designed for. And so, in order for our relationship to be made right with God, someone needed to come along and and act and live in total and perfect obedience, even obedience unto death, to not only demonstrate for us what that looks like, because we kind of lost it and we don't get it, but also to take our places there too. So he is our obedience for us. Not only does he take the punishment for our crimes, his obedience stands in in place of our disobedience. And so Jesus lives his whole life learning and growing in obedience and practicing more and more and more obedience until the point where he is obedient even unto death. One last phrase that we need to unpack for a moment. And, and that, that is this, this quote. It says, so Christ in verse 5, so Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, you are my son, today I have become your father. Any idea what that's all about? It comes from Psalm 2. Psalm 2. And, and it is not saying, that the, the words here are, are quite important. It is not saying that somehow Jesus was not the son at some point. Right? Notice that it first says, you are my son. And then it says, today I have become your father. And this is, this is hearkening back to the time when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River and the Spirit of God descends upon him in the form of a dove and the, the, the words from God on high say to him, you are my son, um, in you I am well pleased, right? And, and it is a public acknowledgement of who Jesus as a human being has become and the faithfulness with which he has lived. It, it's like, it's a little bit like when, when my son Aaron, he fixes his grandfather's computer problems, right? And I've been doing that for him for years and years and years, right? But Aaron does it, and he does it super well, and he does it super patiently, and it's great. And I say, that's my boy, right? Because I'm proud of him. I am proud of what he has done. I am proud of who he is becoming as a man. That's my boy. And, and here, too, God is saying to his son, Jesus, look, here, publicly, before all the people of Israel, everyone who is around, you are my son. I am your father. Because, of course, that's heretical for any normal human being to claim on their own. 
right? Jesus, remember, on numerous occasions was about to be stoned for this very kind of claim, right? His I am statements throughout the Gospels <laughs> where constantly the people of Israel were threatening to kill him and eventually they did it because they said he claimed to be the Son of God. And Hebrews unpacks for us that God himself recognizes that truth. That he is indeed the son. But of course, unpacking these details, while it is good, doesn't get us to the heart of the thing. Because the heart of the thing is this high priest question. Right? This is beautiful. Listen again to the first few verses of chapter 5. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God. To offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and who are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. And this is beautiful. Because Jesus, the God who is, the Gospel of John says, the Word of God, the living Word of God, through whom the universe was created and we are told is sustained. That, that Jesus, that Son, is asked by the Father to become one of us, to become our great high priest. And he does it. He empties himself of everything. Right? Jesus did not do anything that he did while on this earth through his own power. Right? That is why he says, you will do things even greater than this. And, and that is why he talks about doing the will of the Father. He didn't come and, and, and resist the temptation of Satan in, after his 40 days in the desert. He didn't resist that by cheating and taking the power of God. No, no, he resisted that in his humanity, in perfect submission to God. And so, just like a good high priest, Jesus can be gentle with us because he too has felt temptation. He too knows our weaknesses. He too is acquainted with grief. He too is a man of sorrows. He too knows what it is like. And so he deals gently with us. He deals gently with us. And he offers himself as the sacrifice. The only sacrifice that matters. He's appointed by God for us. And I think, brothers and sisters, we often don't remember the significance of that. He loves you. He knows you. He was part of knitting you together in your mother's womb. He was part of knowing you before the foundation of the world. He was 
part of planning in advance the good things for you to do. And he was part of this whole scheme to, to become a human and to live as one of us, to learn and to grow and to triumph for us. Brothers and sisters, we need to hold on to this awe and wonder. We need to remember that the good news that we have is not some small thing. It is certainly not some weakness. And it is not something that we should be ashamed of or keep private to ourselves. It is not something that is just between God and me. It is earth-shattering, thunderous, incredible, life-altering news. great high priest appointed by God who knows us better than we know ourselves and is gentle and humble and kind and righteous and holy and awesome. It's no wonder the creatures around the throne say holy, holy, holy. For that is what he is. And his praise must go on all through eternity and in our hearts today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your son, Jesus Christ. And we confess that we do not understand even the smallest portion really, truly of what he has done and is doing and will do for us. But the very little that we do understand, Lord, it makes us stand in awe. It makes us want to fall on our knees to worship him, to praise him forever, O oh God. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us, O oh Lord. To worship you. To worship through your son Jesus. Our great high priest. Help us, O oh God, to learn obedience as he learned obedience. And help us, O oh God, deal gently with us when we go astray. Father, Help us to praise your name forever in all that we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.